topics that didn't get picked up on that video, and then we'll backtrack onto the copyright topics. And that way, I will have both sets of what I was going to cover in a video clip, and then we will probably get through everything this time. We got through most of it yesterday, but it just didn't get on the video. So, I'll be happy also to take questions. Yes? Do you have on the same clothes? <laughs> Not quite. <laughs>
right to publish one time. Make sure you get that in writing so that there's no question later when you have an opportunity to publish that work somewhere else or to tell a different version of that story to create what's called a derivative work. You want to make sure that you still have the rights. Derivative works are works that um, are based upon another work. So um, the best example of a derivative work that I can tell you that you're going to recognize is in the Harry Potter book series. So J.K. Rowling wrote the, the books, and there were seven of them, and at some point, you know, it was very complex to keep up with the characters, and of course she licensed the rights to be made into films, and so those were derivative works. The movies were derivative works. She gave someone, the film production companies, the rights through her um, copyright assignments to create those derivative works, and she made millions and millions of dollars from that. Um, there was another enterprising writer who thought these characters are very complex, it's hard to keep them straight, so I'm going to create a Harry Potter lexicon. And it was sort of an encyclopedia or dictionary of Harry Potter characters, so that anybody who was a fan of the series could then go and, to, you know, and purchase this book. They had, I think, started with it on a website, and then they were given a chance to publish it as a book. And that particular writer you know, was very creative, put a lot of work into it, had a publishing deal, and then suddenly J.K. Rowling found out that this other person was publishing a derivative work based on her novels. And so she and her publisher sued to stop that based on copyright protections that she had. And she won that lawsuit. So a derivative work is a work that is based upon another work that you've created. And that's where a lot of the value comes from, let's say you create a beautiful short story that's based on a real life experience, people that you admire, or you know a very challenging family situation. So you create that and you sell that story to a magazine, to a web publisher, to a newspaper. If you put it out there, then if you did not reserve the derivative rights to that work, somebody else is going to have the right to get the film income from that if suddenly Lifetime Television calls and says we want to make a TV movie about this beautiful story. They're not going to call you they're going to call that other um, publisher that you have given the copyright to. So you want to make sure you have a contract that defines what you're giving up and that you know what that is. It's very likely that you're going to be asked to give up you know, all rights for a book. But you would, in a reputable publishing contract, be given royalties for any derivative works that are created. So that's what J.K. Rowling has. I mean, she has a publishing deal, and she gets a percentage of the works that are created based on her works. But there's control within the copyright holder. They have a right to say, no, we're going to do this. Yes, we're going to do this. So that's true for any series of books. You want to have the derivative rights. You want to make sure your contract specifically defines what you're giving up. It may say you're giving up all worldwide. I've seen a globe, not just global, but, you know, into the cosmos, basically. I forget the term that they use, but it was essentially... Intergalactic. Something like intergalactic, yes. And they wanted all those rights to be given up. And that's fine if that's what you want to give up. Just make sure that you're going to get royalties from the works that are produced and distributed intergalactically, and that, that you know that you're giving those up. Um, ideally, though, rather than giving up um, everything, you would want to give up a non-exclusive license for one-time publication rights. So you're probably familiar with all rights versus first North American serial rights, so make sure you define what it is. Um, if you're giving up limited rights, you're probably going to be required today to give up rights to publish it on the web, but try to get it as non-exclusive as possible. Know what you're signing, get a lawyer if you need to to help negotiate it, but make sure you're compensated for everything. And in today's world with print on demand, it's important to make sure your contract is very specific about what happens when the book goes out of print, if it's a book deal. Because you don't want to be left with um, the inability to get the rights back if the publisher starts stops distributing hard copies. You want to get those rights back and publish it yourself and sell it you know, on a 100 lot basis or even one by one, print on demand. Those are possibilities today. And they're not going to cost you any more money, um, but you can 
set up through Amazon and other services to sell your books directly. So you want to make sure the rights for those works revert back to you if you gave up all rights in a book deal. You want to get those back. And you need to define what it means when something goes out of print. Because the question can come up, is it really out of print if it's print on demand? And so we, the publisher, can print when somebody wants to buy a copy so it's not out of print. So make sure that, you know, at some point, if you haven't collected royalties in, say, one year and it's no longer available in hard copy, then if they've pulled it off their list, you need to make sure that's defined. So those are some important things to consider, whether it's all rights, limited rights, exclusive, meaning nobody else can publish it, or a non-exclusive, you can sell that same story or a variation on that story to somebody else. And if there is no contract like columnists in the well, if you have a newspaper that you're working with or a magazine, they probably have a policy that is published somewhere on their website or on their masthead. So look for that to see if you submit something and they choose to publish it, there's probably something that says we have assumed ownership of this or we have transferred the copyright to us. Oftentimes, though, it will say it's a non-exclusive transfer. So they have a right to publish it one time, but then you can sell it to somebody else. The main thing is to know beforehand, before you submit, what it is that the terms are. If it's the newspaper is going to get all rights upon submission, if the newspaper says, you know, once you submit it to us and we publish it, it's ours, you've given up all rights. If there is no mention anywhere, then you could argue, well, the typical expectation is that I've given you the right to publish the North, you know, first North American serial rights and electronic rights for one time or you know, for distribution of this paper online. But if it's not spelled out, you're going to then have a legal battle over what did you move, what were the expectations. You've got to have a meeting of the minds to have a contract. And so the publisher was going to argue, well, you gave us everything because we didn't have it spelled out. And the writer's going to say, no, I didn't. I only gave you limited first North American serial rights and one-time electronic publishing rights. So it, there needs to be something to find. And if you can't find it, don't give it to them. <clears throat> Put it in an email. Make sure that you get a, you know, it can, an email can be a contract. If you've sent it, and it's been accepted, and the terms are agreed upon, it doesn't have to be written up by a lawyer. But put it in writing. Don't just rely on, you know, an oral statement. I sold some travel pieces to the Birmingham News, and my contract says first North American serial rights, not exclusive. So I can do that story again. But it's not always the case. So make sure that you get that specifically in writing. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, let's see. So those are the basics of assignment of rights and licensing. Um, the Creative Commons is a nonprofit organization that people put together several years ago to provide something beyond our standard copyright system. Because when you create a work, it's protected by copyright. We'll come back to that in depth. But what the Creative Commons does, it's a licensing system that lets you accept or make your work available under a Creative Commons license. And there are a lot of different tiers. You can say, I'm going to make this, let's say, a photo available uh, with a Creative Commons license that anyone can use this for a non-commercial purpose. I'm going to let you do it, but you have to give me credit as the photographer. So I like to take a lot of nature pictures and travel pictures. Yes. How does that work like with like with YouTube, for example? Mm -hmm. Supposedly, you're, when you put something on YouTube, mm -hmm. you have no rights to it whatsoever there, but I guess whenever you're transferring it uh, to, uh, you can still transfer it to another market. I right. Guess. Yeah, and so, okay, so I'm going to put my video on YouTube for this lecture. Anybody can publish it. Anybody? That. Not necessarily. Really? Because that's just what I was told. No. I mean, I can embed it on my site. <clears throat> By putting it out there, I'm making it available for people to share unless I check some boxes that say no. But I, I don't let you download copies of it. I put things on Vimeo also. And um, actually, Vimeo, 
I've got permission through YouTube to upload longer videos, but anything, if I did a class lecture for 50 minutes, I'd have to put it on video. But you can you can make selections when you put it on YouTube as to how it can be available. It can be limited to private individuals that you share it with. But I put it out there for public purposes. And anybody else is free to <coughs> embed it in their website unless I turn that off, which I can do. But I don't mind because I want to, you know, we, I want to build, you know, a reputation as a, a knowledgeable speaker for conferences and things like that. So on YouTube, if it's out there, you can embed it on your website if you um, if you want to do that, unless they disabled that function. But what you can't do is take that YouTube video and put together a compilation and then sell you know DVDs of those videos. You don't have the right to do that unless you're the owner of that. So this video that I'm shooting, I'm going to be the copyright owner, and I'm going to put it on YouTube. So I'm giving YouTube a non-exclusive license to distribute my video to whomever wants to look at it. And those people, because I'm not going to turn off embedding, I'm going to let other people share it on their site. But it's pretty clear the way it's set up. You know, video came from me. I'm the one who uploaded it. Nobody can go in and change that. They can't change the name of the author. So it's kind of hard to plagiarize a video off YouTube. But certainly a photo that I put on my blog, I have a picture of a couple of cardinals fighting, and I got really lucky when I shot it. And so if I put that video, that photo on my blog, somebody else could come along and find it, right-click and download it, and put it out there on their site and claim ownership of it because there's nothing in that photo unless I embed a watermark to say it's my picture that... Um, that, you know, there's nothing to prevent somebody from doing that. So every time I put a picture out without that copyright notice embedded through Photoshop, and it's kind of complicated to do, I think. I've done it, and it, I didn't like the process. There's an easier way to do it that I haven't figured out yet, because I have to do it with some other yeah. stuff. But um, <coughs> somebody was trying to show me, and it was too complicated for that moment. Um, but you can't use any picture you find on the web. And... I want some of my photos to be out there so that I can maybe sell some photos to stock photography organizations. And so I can put them on and give a Creative Commons license to start spreading the word about it. And it doesn't mean that people won't steal it, but it does give people a right to use it and give me credit for it. I can make um, the choices for the Creative Commons are, you know, use it for any purpose as long as you provide attribution. Use it only for non-commercial purposes on the web. You know, you can. There are a lot of different options that you can check and make available your work through there. And you can also search for other people's work. So if you've written a story, and a magazine editor says, "Can you provide some photos of this?" and you don't have a way to get any good pictures to go with your story, then you can go to the Creative Commons and look for photos that people have licensed for use in print. Now they're going to get credit as the photographer for that. And so it's, you know, it's, it's a pretty well spelled out process. If you're not familiar with it, just spend a little time looking at the Creative Commons as, as how you can use it as a writer, photographer, illustrator, and how you can use it to <coughs> obtain photos and illustrations that will help you in your own work. Questions back? Yeah. When we're using Microsoft Word or Microsoft Publisher, da da da, and go to Microsoft.com Clip arts, uh -huh. clip art. Does that apply to that as well, or can you use the Microsoft clip art in your? Probably the way the Microsoft license works. If they've made the clip art available, you could use it on a website. Even for resale, for selling. Well, it probably says in the fine print of the Microsoft software license that okay. you can't use it, but it may. I don't I haven't read it, so it really depends on what that says. I don't really use clip art anymore, but if you were, you know, it's going to be easy to find clip art that you can put on the web because there are plenty of people who create it to get their name out there or not even their name, they just do it for fun. But, um, and you certainly can use it for non-commercial purposes. Whether you could use it in a commercial brochure, it's going to really depend on the terms of that license and I haven't, I haven't read it, honestly. Yes? If you just um, go into like Google Images and mm -hmm. say you wanted a picture of a flower or something, mm -hmm. How would you know if you can use that picture? Just assume that you can't. Okay. 
And so that's the first thing, because just because it's in Google Images or in you know your friend on Facebook sharing a picture, or you go to Pinterest, which is really popular, or Flickr, where I put my pictures. Um, if you go to those sites and just find the picture you want, and you know you can take it and use it, but you probably are committing copyright infringement in a couple of different ways. One, you don't really know if the person from whom you got that picture was the copyright owner. They may have taken it from somebody else. So you have to be very careful about that. Now, if it's a, a stock clip art source, um, freeclipart.com or any of those places, they're going to have terms of use spelled out on their site that will tell you that it's okay to use it for non-commercial purposes or non-profit purposes, but if it's for commercial, maybe you can't use it. So if you can find the original source of the photo or illustration, then go to that website that is truly the owner and you can find terms of use. There are, if you do web design, you can find textures and backgrounds and things like that that you can use. And often, they will clearly spell out, you know, I'm making these available, you know, for you to use on a website, no problem. In other cases, they will link you back to the originating website, which then you will have to go look at the terms of use there. So you, it, you just have to do a little homework, and sometimes you will find clear-cut statement you can use this, clear-cut statement you cannot, but you can't assume that you can use it just because you found it. So that's so the just because you put free stock and it comes up, you can't just right. Use it. Yeah, because I could be a you know a person who has bad intent or just not knowledgeable. And I could go out and I want to get traffic to my website, so I find all these really great pictures, put on my site, and say, free, come help yourself. You know, it'd be like robbing a bank and giving out their money. Yeah. It's the same thing. And so you can't just assume that somebody says it's free, that they have the rights to tell you it is. So find those terms of use. I work like local tourism, so if I go out and take pictures. I need to put a, maybe a watermark on them or something. In yeah, case. It, yeah, and you can, I mean, it's not that complicated to, yeah. to go in and do it. But if you just put it in on the edge of the photo, it's really easy, you know, to crop the picture and take that, take that out. So it really needs to be embedded as a watermark in the code underneath the picture that you see. So When it's embedded, it's not visible? Right. It is visible in the PBS. I mean, you can see the watermark if you really look, and if you ever download it, then we'll see it on that JK or PDF. Yeah, and so it depends on, so it's, I have done that too with some of them, and you can see it. So it really depends on what kind of watermark that you have created and embedded. But there's a way in Photoshop to do it so that you don't see it. That it's actually, it's a, written into the code. Because I, I managed to do it one time, it just took me a long time. And that was not hard to see some of the watermarks. Yeah. So is there... Is there a way then to, uh, to undo that water code and the water mark? No. Once it's in the code, it, you know, a copyright infringer is not going to be able. They can still use the picture, uh -huh. but it will be easily identifiable as your photo. And what the commercial photography houses will do is they have systems that can patrol the Internet and look for those watermarks and then find the infringing use if it's online. And so that then they will contact you and say it's an infringement, pay up, and or we're gonna sue. Yes. And that's when the watermark goes away. When you buy the actual photo, it doesn't have a watermark. For those, if you buy it from a stock photography house, right. yes, they will. It will be something that shows up, and then it will go away when you buy when, it. when you purchase it. Yes, because they can take it out. Yeah. I want to take you down a rabbit trail. So if you're gonna deal with this later, just say so and I'll wait. Okay. Um, Kind of connected to the photography, what if you're, say, writing a cookbook mm -hmm. and you want to refer to a specific product, mm -hmm. like Jello or okay. whatever, or if you are writing a story and you want to mention a real place? Okay. The, that falls under the category of trademarks, and I'm, I don't have a specific segment to talk about that, but I get questions and so it'll come up again. It's okay when you're writing to make a um, innocuous or just, you know, real life kind of a reference into a trademarked product or place. You don't have to get permission, you know, to, if I wanted to write a review of Jell-O foods, you know, I could write about it as a critique and I could use the Jell-O trademark 
in my review. There's a First Amendment right to do that. I can even be critical if I wanted to of a particular product or brand. I can't speak. There are some laws that uh, you can't make false statements about products. You can get in trouble for that, just like you can't make false statements about people. And so there are product disparagement laws that can come into play if you are bad-mouthing a product in a false way. If it's true, then it's a different set of uh, issues. But just if you're doing it in a benign, perfectly you know, not harmful way, just referring to a brand, then it's okay to do that. Make sure to include the R or the TM on the first reference is a practice that they like to show that you know that it's a trademark or brand. So, and you should, you know, write it if it's a capital first letter, use the capital first letter, treat it as somebody's property and respect that and it's okay to do that. Um, you, you, it starts to cross the line if you were gonna say, take a picture of a Nike tennis shoe that you have, um, you know, you think it's a great photo because you've done some weird light things, you know, you take a picture of that and you're going to sell a picture of that shoe as a poster or something. Then, then at that point you're trying to commercialize your work using somebody else's trademark and it's the same that we are going to talk about, the right of publicity for individuals. And so Celebrities and all of us have the right to control the commercial use of our name and likeness. And so we can't make money off of other people's name and likeness without their permission. And the same would be true with, you know, a picture of a Barbie doll or something like that. When should you use copy space? Copy space. The, the copy like last year, I did a lot of writing for like online and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so they would always want you, it's a website that you go to and... Uh, check it or they'll check it and make sure you didn't copy it from somebody else. Okay. And what happens is if if it's actually copied from other websites, mm -hmm. it will bring up like a search of all those websites. So that's an example of something I think that would fall the category of scraping. <coughs> so that they want to make sure that you didn't scrape what somebody you call that? Copy, copy space. space. I'm not familiar with that particular service. But, you know, some publishers, online publishers, may ask that you use that. I've never yeah. been asked, and I know personally. Well, there are several it. websites out there that have that technology. Right. And that. there is a reference on my um, last page, and I was going to put some more links for you on the blog, preventing scraping in WordPress. Um, let me make sure that I'm going to get it. Yes, I'm sorry. Right. Um, scraping oh, is a... Um, oh, yes, yeah, the same. I didn't have any more. I don't have any more of the notes version, but it's the same information. Now, recently, last year, Crackle Wines down in Montgomery mm -hmm. uh, sued the Montgomery Advertiser because it was they had solicited boys to come to this Crackle, which is one of the state championships. Mm -hmm. Actually, sued the Montgomery Advertiser for that because they used the Crackle Wines logo in a in an article that wasn't good mm -hmm. about Crackle High School. Okay, and they won that. If it's a, if it's, that falls, it sounds like in the category of somebody argue it was libelous, negative, um, then if the person who doesn't like what's said about you, um, if, about themselves, thinks that it is an organization, a business, product, person, if they, if it's false and it reflects negatively on them, then they can win. Um, if it's true, and you can prove it's true, then you should not lose that lawsuit because truth is a defense to any statement that's, you know, if, you know, if you write a story about a person who had an illegitimate child, then that's a true statement if they truly had that child out of wedlock. So they can't sue for that. They might, if, if nobody knew the child was illegitimate then it becomes a matter of invasion of privacy. And so there might be some rape reasons to be able to recover for that. But if everybody knows the child was born out of wedlock, it's public knowledge, then it's not something that, you know, it might, it might be embarrassing, but it's not libelous because it's true. Well, they had used that logo for years covering the black crack yeah. lines. I mean, and nothing had ever been said until that um, article that was not complimentary, it was kind of an investigative article. Mm -hmm. um, but the lawsuit did not, I mean, this 
this was pending with the athletic association, so they had not had a verdict from that, so the advertiser did that preliminary coverage on that. And, and Frapple Husky got real, real upset. Really? I'm surprised they, I mean, just from what little bit you said, it's surprising that they could win that if it's a legitimate news story and they're reporting facts, but it, it, Well, I think the advertiser just kind of, it was saying, Okay, so they, I mean, they may not have wanted to fight it yeah. because that, you know, it's a it's a silencing mechanism. A lot of times, people who have been embarrassed by the news will threaten to sue or actually sue to make it go away. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that backfires, and people, more people know about it than did before. So you have to be careful. But so that's kind of a category of libel. Let me mention the scraping as an aspect of web um, copyright infringement and. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on scraping, but it is, there are some tools available for um, you to use as a writer, especially if, if you're publishing online for an employer or for yourself, then you want to make sure that your content isn't stolen by somebody else. And so if you're using the WordPress platform, which can run websites that look like <coughs> traditional websites, not just old-fashioned blogs, um, there are a lot of tools available that you can plug into your WordPress dashboard that will help catch people, or not so much people, the little software programs called bots that they use, or spiders that patrol the internet and pick things up and then put them somewhere else. And you can get pinged backs so that you're notified when somebody has taken copy and linked to your site. And I have a, a slide of a little picture of a screen grab, there's a website called Organic Rapeseed Oil that um, I got a ping back on my blog that they had taken the title and the paragraph and embedded that or just you know put it, the copy, yeah. onto a place on the website for the Organic Rapeseed Oil where you can buy that product. Fortunately for me, I mean, they have a link to see everything else, you've got to go back to my website. So in that sense, it doesn't hurt me. It directs traffic back to my site. So although it's a scraping example, it's not necessarily detrimental. So not all scraping is horrible. What they are doing is creating copy content for the rapeseed site to bring people there and maybe help improve their own search engine rankings. And so those are reasons they would do this because if they don't have content, nobody's going to go to their site. So by taking a little bit of my content, putting it there, it's going to drive traffic to their site. I left it up for now because I wanted to use it for this example and so to, to, have it, to show you what scraping is. And from looking at it, I'm not so bothered at this point that I may just let it be there and see if it drives any traffic back to my site for people to look at this recipe. On the other hand, I've got mine set up that I have to approve, so when I get notice of a ping back, I can automatically see if I want to approve it or not, and I can reject it, and it doesn't show up as a comment on my blog, and I can also then go investigate that this person take my copy. So I'm getting this notice underneath, you know, it's not something I have to deal with every day. It automatically tells me that it's out there. You can also, there, I don't have the names of these sites, but when you mentioned is, sounds like an example of this, where you can put your blog post into their database and it will then troll around the internet and search to see if anybody has taken it in whole or in part. And so those are great resources if you have a really great essay or story and you, you, know, you have a feeling maybe somebody might have taken it or you just are curious. Some of them will Or even if you accept articles for your own blog. Yes, from someone so, else. Yeah. Because you don't want to get sued right. for having infringing content on your blog right. if you've let a guest writer come in and do it. And so you can use it. Some of them are free. Some of them will charge after a certain number of uses. And some of them you can just set up, a, I think, a subscription purpose, uh, subscription arrangement with them to you know pay to submit everything through those or to check other copy. So that's the uh, concept of scraping. If you do find that somebody has scraped your content, you want to get in touch with them and give them a takedown notice under the um, Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And if there's a form available that I'll put a link to, but there's a statutory form that you can just fill in the blanks basically and send them and says, 
know, this is my material, you're infringing my copyright, take it down. And if they don't, then you can have the right to pursue more. Yes. Is that a standard software? If you're, if you're, like you mentioned WordPress, if you got a blog, that's a standard software that they offer. You don't have to have something extra. Right. It is, you, you would have to affirmatively find their plugins through WordPress. You can just search for WordPress plugins, and then you have to take a couple steps. But it's just basically point and click to install it. Yes. Okay, I got the concept mm -hmm. of scraping, but can I take you right back to the beginning? What's a good ten-word definition for scraping? Scraping would be um, an automated uh, software program that cruises the internet underneath the operations and finds content, steals it, and puts it on another website. So it's not if I if I found somebody's blog mm -hmm. and, and you can't really print it off, mm -hmm. but you can take and highlight it and put it in a word document. Is that scraping? If you're just using it for research purposes, mm -hmm. it's going to be okay to do that. But if you take that copy and copy it and place it into a post on your site, oh, okay. then that starts to get into copyright infringement. But if you copy it and give it to someone else, uh, just in a teaching session? If it's for teaching and educational purposes, that's probably a okay. fair use. Okay. You know, if I were to um, go and make photocopies of lots of content from someone's website and pass out at this program, there's a point at which it goes beyond a fair use and I start to infringe their copyright, but limited distributions for educational purposes are okay, so we're going to talk about that. In Especially if you get a lot of rare for your teaching, mm -hmm. right? that's, yeah. that's yes. money making. Right? Yes, it starts to become you know, commercial use and not an educational or critical use. So, was that definition of scraping? Yes. Okay. So, yes. Okay. Um, I don't know, this is sound too difficult. Okay. Um, I wrote an article, and I and I was reading a book um, that I took that I quoted. I, I mentioned the book name and the author. Um, but of course, there's a footnote attached to it. So now, at what point? How do you how do you list that your article? Do you give credit to the original per author? Or the author that it was that borrowed it. Both. Both. Okay. Yeah, it's. I mean, the person who is the original author has to be given credit. Okay. Because he was given credit in the other person's book. Yes. I mean, they're the they're the one who really owned that. Okay. If they quoted from it, then if all the person did was quote and they didn't add any commentary to it, then you can probably just give credit to the original person. But if it's anything that's interpretive of that other person's work, then there's a second copyright that exists to yeah. the author to which where you found it. Okay. Um, so we're about to go into copyright. And I wanted to mention, before we do that, just this idea of works for hire. Because if you do a work for hire, you do not have the copyright for that. And I want to make sure you're clear on what that is. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually, this past year, done a lot of writing as a work for hire, as a ghostwriter for um, a company who's doing some web publishing. And um, it was clearly spelled out in my contract that the contractor will not claim any rights of ownership in or to any work of, author of authorship created by him or her under this agreement. All works are considered works made for hire as defined by the copyright agreement. And I know that. I'm being paid adequately for it. It's the kind of thing, it's not my story. It's factual information that I'm putting together in informative short pieces for the web. And I can take that same concept and write it 25 different ways for 25 different clients. So it, you know, I'm not going to write it the same. It's not going to be that I'm doing this work for somebody else. So I'm doing a work for hire. I'm paid for it. And that's it. And you know, if I were to write the greatest essay in the world that suddenly is taken and then published in you know a book form, I can't be given credit for that. I know that, and I'm not worried about it. But um, make sure that you know if you're asked to create a work for hire, that you, you're giving up everything in exchange for that one paycheck. Is that through a content agency, SEO? Um, in this case, it's an, an ad agency in Birmingham. They do advertising and marketing. That's how I got that assignment. 
But if you are an employee and you are creating content for um, an employer that you work for, you are by definition creating works for hire unless you have some kind of special contractual relationship with your employer that says any writings that you perform outside of these areas belongs to you. So it, that works for hire can actually be challenging for you know chemists and people who are doing scientific research. But if it's something that you're doing as part of your job, then it's a work for hire unless there's a specific employment contract exception to that. So you can't show it if it's if you've done ghost writing mm -hmm. and you want to show another client who wants to hire you. Mm -hmm. You can't use that as... It depends. In my contract, I have a confidentiality provision. So I couldn't link to that content on my blog and say, this goes in my portfolio because I've agreed not to do that. But if it didn't say that, then I wouldn't have a problem with it. And, um, you know, it's possible that I could ask them, you know, could I pass this one out and show as an example? They'd probably say yes, but I'm, I don't need to do that. So. But if, if you do a work for hire it's, or any kind of a ghost written arrangement, you could be a ghost writer who's not doing a work for hire. You could be a ghost writer who's getting paid a royalty for the sale of those books. It depends on the contract that you sign. But in this, I wanted to focus on works for hire as employees. So if you're a reporter working for a newspaper and you write a story for that newspaper as a paid employee of the newspaper, the newspaper owns that work. You as the writer or reporter don't own that story. And you can't take it and sell it somewhere else. You might, if you leave that paper, if you didn't have a non-compete or something, depending on what kind of employment contract you had, you might be able to write a book about that, you know, some research that you did, but it would have to be a new story. It would depend on the relationship that you had in your employment contract. So just know that, you know, if you are on staff, at church and you're doing VBS lesson material for your church as part of your job, then the church is going to technically own the copyright on that and get it work for hire. You may be, you know, work out an arrangement if you're doing some extra stuff. Make sure that it's not part of your job and then it's yours. Yes. Some newspaper reporters are clearly permitted to do freelance or writing outside of the scope of their employment, they may write a book. And so those things are worked out with the employer. What is this public domain? Public domain is a any work that was originally copyrighted, once a certain period of time has passed, then that work becomes part of the public domain, meaning it's not protected by copyright. And anyone can use that work in any way, shape, or form. But they cannot copyright it themselves. Right. If it's in the public domain. Um, the lyrics to Amazing Grace are really old. They are in the public domain. So is music. So anybody can do a recording of Amazing Grace. And anybody else could do a report, recording of Amazing Grace. If I go and get a record deal and sing Amazing Grace, then my record company or myself, if I do it, as a self-publishing record artist, um, I own the copyright to that sound recording. So somebody else can't take my sound recording and sell MP3s of it. <coughs> but there's nothing to stop you or you or anybody, everybody in the room can go record their own version of Amazing Grace and we each have a copyright in our own version of it. So the public domain is helpful, especially for anything really old. Um, the copyright protections currently protect works for 70 years plus the life of the author and some things were grandfathered in. So just assume that if something was created in the 20th century, it's probably not in the public domain. It doesn't mean that it's not because things had to be renewed and depending on when it was originally created, <coughs> then it might be in the public domain. But if it's a 20th century creation, Assume it's still protected and then go find out if it's not. And you can do research through the Library of Congress to try to determine, you know, some things will, you will be able to find an answer there. Most of the time you won't, but sometimes you can. Um, so.
So let's talk briefly in the last few minutes about the basics of copyright, and I'll try to then take a few questions. Um, copyright is the um, body of law, including specific United States statutes and statutes that are international and treaties that they've all agreed to have a pretty standard system within the World Intellectual Property Organization to have protections for creative works of authorship. And so copyright protects something that is an original work of authorship is created. It has to have some element of originality to it. A list of telephone numbers is not protected by copyright. A single recipe is not protected by copyright because it's considered a list of ingredients and factual ways to organize those. But if you take a bunch of recipes and put them into a cookbook that you have creatively organized, you have added some illustrations, you've maybe written some descriptions or um, anecdotes about the person who gave you that recipe or how you created it or you know health tips, all kinds of little added um, nuggets of information, then that cookbook becomes an original creative work that can be protected by copyright. What, what about, like, you know, you got these companies that are restaurants, mm -hmm. like, that have the secret recipe, and I mean, those things are copyright on their mind, really. No, the secret recipe, if it's completely a secret recipe and they have never divulged the ingredients like the Coke formula, it's going to be protected as a trade secret. And so there's this body of law that deals with trade secrets. You can take formula for products and get patents on those, but patents by definition have to be disclosed and patents will expire after a period of time, which is why they don't get patents on those secret, you know, crispy chicken recipe things. They protect them as trade secrets and they have to put in place a lot of um, safeguards within their corporate structure to make sure people don't have those and then divulge them. Because once it's out in the public, it's no longer a trade secret. So copyrights protect the creative works. Trademarks protect statements or um, indicators of the origin or the source of a product. So the trademarks are those brand things. Logos, images that represent a particular um, product or brand or service. Yes. I'm writing a story, say I want to write about Hula Pie at Dukes in Waikiki. And I want to reference, you know, we got Hula Pie at Dukes in Waikiki. Mm -hmm. And I just use the description that they put in their menu of what Hula Pie is. Is that acceptable or is that an infringement? That should be fine. Okay. You know, if you wrote that you get food poisoning from <laughs> eating that, they're probably going to get you under trade disparagement. But it's not going to be a trademark infringement okay. to write it that way. Okay. If you tried to claim that phrase as your own mm -hmm. product in Alabama, then you might be violating the trademark. But if you're just writing about it in a work of fiction or even a factual story, it's okay. Okay. What, what about family pictures? Family pictures, the copyright belongs to the photographer who took that picture, so you need to get permission from that family member who took the picture, mm -hmm. even if you've got the picture in possession. Mm -hmm. I'm the family photographer mm -hmm. and have been forever. And even if I use somebody else's camera, I might could argue for it for hire, but you're really not. Do you need permission from the person who is in the picture to be able to use it? That is a right of publicity or a right of privacy question. Depending on what you're going to use it for, if you have subjects in a photo, you should probably get a model release if you're going to publish it without, you know, you want to have something that says, you know, I'm not just putting this in my scrapbook anymore or on my Facebook photo album. I'm actually going to publish it now for commercial purposes. And so most publishers are going to require that you get a model release. If it's taken in a public place, arguably you don't have to, but to be on the safe side, you want to make sure. If it's taken in a private home, though, it's not a public place. But if you're doing like a travel article or something, you're at a, a sightseeing venue. It's public. Public, so anybody's pitch, whether it's a kid or an adult, okay. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, you have occasionally people who are the subject yeah. of those pictures will sue for it. And if you use that photo out of context, instead of using it yeah. in a travel magazine, you took a picture at an amusement park, and instead of using it in a travel story about an amusement yeah. park, if you use it in a story about health problems, obesity, yeah. then there is a body of law 
that would let people in some states sue over the use of that photo because it is a distortion of they were not you know they were not there it was not a tourism story which would make sense but it was rather something that makes them the subject of this obesity or sexually transmitted diseases or whatever you know the completely off the subject story would be about because there was a few years back it was all over the news where this guy has he was a model or something had his picture on a label mm -hmm. and he sued the company mm -hmm. No, that's the right of publicity cases. So everybody has a right to control how your image is used for commercial purposes. And that goes back to getting the, the model license. But you can't, um, if you had a great book, you know, you can't use a photo of a celebrity endorsing your book unless they've given you permission to do that. And probably you're paying them for it. Um, you can't, you know, even through parodies, have it look like celebrities are endorsing your books or writings or websites or amusement park or business. Um, oftentimes, small businesses will create funny little um, commercials, that maybe your print or radio or whatever, and it implies that celebrities have been there and, and approve of their product or business. If the celebrity finds out about it, they're going to get nailed with a right of publicity complaint. They may not get a suit, maybe. They will just say, stop doing this. But it happens all the time. I mean, there are thousands of cases on those things. So just don't use anybody's name or likeness without permission. Um, I know we're probably, we are over time. <laughs> just really quickly on copyright. And this is in the video. All about what I'm going to say in the next two or three minutes is in the video from last time, so you'll be able to watch it. Once you create your work, and save it in a tangible medium, whether you write it on a piece of paper, snap a photo, hit save on your word processor, um, any of those ways you have copyright protection at that moment. It is not required that you go register it and pay money. There are reasons to do that, it helps, but you don't have to and there's no reason to do it in the short term. Ultimately, you will want to register a major work and have copyright protection, but if you get you know, if you sell the story, license the story, or get a book deal, the publisher is going to take care of any copyright registration for you. Um, if you self-publish, um, then you should do it. If you have a uh, subsidized publishing arrangement, they're probably going to include that in the deal. You'll just pay for it. They'll take care of the paperwork, but just make sure you spell that out if it's self-publishing. Um, so you don't have to register. You can't copyright ideas, titles, or facts. So anyone can use the same facts. It's raining outside. I cannot copyright that fact. <laughs> if it is raining, I think it is. Um, Abraham Lincoln was shot by John Wilkes Booth. We're all free to write historical novels about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln and the facts that are out there. We have to tell our story in an original way, but we don't have to, for things that are common knowledge, factual, verifiable from many different sources, that's not something original. But the way a story is told is original, and that story is protected. So if you're doing um, research um, on topics, then the factual parts you don't have to attribute, but if it's something that is an interpretation of the meaning behind events, then that's an original idea. So for both intellectual honesty as well as copyright, you want to attribute it. You, can, you have a fair use opportunity to use certain limited portions, say a small quotation from a novel, a single sentence or two from a novel. Um, it's going to probably be a fair use in most cases. Um, but you can't, there's not a defined rule as to how many words take it from okay to infringement. It's not that it's five words or 50 words. It's, there's a fair use analysis. I've kind of given you the key points in the handout. There are four different aspects that a court would look at to see is this a fair use. One of them is, is it academic learning, educational criticism, commentary. So if I am a movie critic and I show 30 seconds from a two hour film in a criticism of that movie, pro or bad, either way, then I have a right to use a small portion of that for criticism and comment. If I am a, a you know, doing a book review, I can quote a sentence or two from the book, maybe a little bit more, but there's a gray area when you cross the line. 
you can't use somebody else's work for commercial purposes, even if you give them credit, it's probably going to be a copyright infringement. Um, but then again, there's the whole idea of parody. Do you all know Weird Al Yankovic? Okay. So he takes the whole essence of someone's song and recreates a different variation. And in most cases, he's going to have a parody right, a fair use, but he doesn't have to get permission. Now, he usually does. But um, there are cases where hip-hop artists have taken samples or reworked songs, and sometimes they have to pay compensation for copyright infringement, and sometimes it's a transformative use that is not copyright infringement. It's considered fair use. So it's very complex, but it's okay to use a you know, small portion for criticism, comment, education. You're not selling it to make money, you're doing it as part of you know, a literary work, so historical fiction. Just make sure that you attribute and give credit to the person. Um, when in doubt, assume it's copyright if it's somebody else's work. Also, just close, I'm gonna close with this and then I'll stick around and answer questions. Plagiarism and copyright are not the same thing. Copyright infringement protects the unauthorized use of work with or without attribution. So if you use my photo on your blog without my permission, you've infringed my copyright. Whether or not you list on there, this photo was taken by Cherie. If you put that up there, it's telling that I'm the owner, but you didn't have my permission, so it's still copyright infringement. If you put the picture up there and imply that you are the photographer, you have just plagiarized as well as infringed copyright. So plagiarism is always copyright infringement. Copyright infringement can occur with or without attribution. So keep that in mind as a distinction. That's what happened with the Cook Source. They were finding interesting stories about food and recipes and comments on food taking those stories, <coughs> editing them a little bit, putting them on the Cook Source website or magazine, giving people credit for it. And you know they thought, well, that was okay because we gave you credit. It was helping your writing career. You got something for your portfolio. But it was copyright infringement. Mm -hmm. So that you can't use other people's work without permission. That's sort of the take up for copyright. So with that, we'll close because I'm out of time. But I will go to all and